Dred Scott versus Sanford, part two, page 225. The state of public opinion had undergone no change when the Constitution was adopted, as is equally evident from its provisions and language. The brief preamble sets forth by whom it was formed, for what purposes, and for whose benefit and protection. It declares that it is formed by the people of the United States, that is to say, by those who are members of the different political communities in the several states, and its great object is declared to be to secure the blessings of liberty to themselves and their posterity. It speaks in general terms of the people of the United States and of citizens of the several states when it is providing for the exercise of the powers granted or the privileges secured to the citizen. It does not define what description of purpose persons are intended to be included under these terms or who shall be regarded as a citizen and one of the people. It uses them as terms so well understood that no further description or definition was necessary. But there are two clauses in the Constitution which point directly and specifically to the Negro race as a separate class of persons and show clearly that they were not regarded as a portion of the people or citizens of the government then formed. One of these clauses reserves to each of the 13 states the right to import slaves until the year 1808, if it thinks proper. And the importation which it thus sanctions was unquestion unquestionably of persons of the race of which we are speaking, as the traffic in slaves in the United States had always been confined to them. And by the other provision, the states pledged themselves to each other to maintain the right of property of the master by delivering up to him any slave who may have escaped from his service and be found within their respective territories. By the first above mentioned clause, therefore, the right to purchase and hold this property is directly sanctioned and authorized for 20 years by the people who framed the Constitution. And by the second, they pledged themselves to maintain and uphold the right of the master in the manner specified as long as the government they then formed should endure. And these two provisions show conclusively that neither the, the description of persons therein referred to nor their descendants were embraced in any of the other provisions of the Constitution, for certainly these two clauses were not intended to confer on them or their posterity the blessings of liberty or any of the personal rights so carefully provided for the citizen. Indeed, when we look to the condition of this race in the several states at the time, it is impossible to believe that these rights and privileges were intended to be extended to them. The legislation of the states therefore shows, in a manner not to be mistaken, the inferior and subject condition of that race at the time the Constitution was adopted, and long afterwards throughout the 13 states by which that instrument was framed, and it is hardly consistent with the respect due to these stakes to suppose that they regarded at that time as fellow citizens and members of the sovereignty, a class of beings whom they had thus stigmatized, whom as we are bound out of respect to the state sovereignties, to assume they had deemed it just and necessary thus to stigmatize and upon whom they had impressed such deep and enduring marks of inferiority and degra degradation, or that when they met in con convention to form the Constitution, they looked upon them as a portion of their constituents, constituents, or designed to include them in the provisions so carefully inserted for the security and protection of the liberties and rights of their citizens. It cannot be supposed that they intended to secure to them rights and privileges and rank in the new political body throughout the Union, which every one of them denied within the limits of its own dominion. More especially, it cannot be believed that the large slaveholding states regarded them as included in the word citizens or would have consented to a constitution which might compel them to receive that character from another state. For if they were so received and entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizens, it would exempt them from the operation of the special laws and from the police regulations which they considered to be necessary for their own safety. It would give to persons of the Negro race who are recognized as citizens in any one state of the Union the right to enter every other state whenever they please, singly or in companies, without pass or passport, and without obstruction to sojourn there as long as they pleased, to go where they pleased at every hour of the day or night without molestation, 
unless they committed some violation of law for which a white man would be punished, and it would give them the full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects upon which its own citizens might speak, to hold public meetings upon political affairs, and to keep and carry arms wherever they went. And all of this would be done in the face of the subject race of the same color, both free and slaves and inevitably producing discontent and insubordination among them and endangering the peace and safety of the state. Upon a full and careful consideration of the subject, the court is of opinion that upon the facts stated in the plea in abatement, Dred Scott was not a citizen of Missouri within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States and not entitled as such to sue in its courts, and consequently that the circuit court had no jurisdiction of the case, and that the judgment on the plea in abatement is erroneous. We proceed, therefore, to inquire whether the facts relied on by the plaintiff entitled him to his freedom. In considering this part of the controversy, two questions arise. Was he, together with his family, free in Missouri by reason of the stay in the territory of the United States here before mentioned? If they were not, is Scott himself free by reason of his removal to Rock Island in the state of Illinois, as stated in the above admissions? We proceed to examine the first question. The act of Congress upon which the plaintiff relies declares that slavery and involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, shall be forever prohibited in all that part of the territory ceded by France under the name of Louisiana which lies north of 36 degrees 30 minutes north latitude and not included within the limits of Missouri. And the difficulty which meets us at the threshold of this part of the inquiry is whether Congress was authorized to pass this law under any of the powers granted to it by the Constitution. For if the authority is not given by that instrument, it is a duty of this court to declare it void and inoperative and incapable of conferring freedom upon any one who is held as a slave under the laws of any one of the states. <clears throat> the counsel for the plaintiff has laid much stress upon that article in the Constitution, which confers on the Congress the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory for other property belonging to the United States. But, in the judgment of the court, that provision has no bearing on the present controversy, and the power there given, whatever it may be, is confined as when, and was intended to be confined to the territory which at that time belonged to or was claimed by the United States, and was within their boundaries as settled by the treaty with Great Britain, and can have no influence upon the territory afterwards required from a foreign government. It was a special provision for a known and particular territory and to meet a present emergency and nothing more. If this clause is construed to extend to territory acquired by the present government from a foreign nation outside of the limits of any charter from the British government to a colony, it would be difficult to say why it was deemed necessary to give the government the power to sell any vacant lands belonging to the sovereignty which might be found within it, and if this was necessary, why the grant of this power should precede the power to legislate over it and establish a government there and still more difficult to say why it was deemed necessary so specially and particularly to grant the power to make the needful rules and regulations in relation to any personal or movable property it might acquire there. For the words other property necessarily by every known rule of interpretation, must mean property of a different description from territory or land. And the difficulty would perhaps be insurmountable in endeavoring to account for the last member of the sentence, which provides that nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims on the United States or any particular state, or to say how many particular state could have claims in it or a territory ceded by a foreign government, or to account for associating this provision with the preceding provisions of the clause, with which it would appear to have no connection. But the power of Congress over the person or property of a citizen can never be a mere discretionary power under a constitution and form of government. 
The powers of the government and the rights and privileges of the citizen are re regulated and plainly defined by the Constitution itself. And when the territory becomes a part of the United States, the federal government enters into possession and the character impressed upon it by those who created it. It, it enters upon it with its powers over the citizen strictly defined and limited by the Constitution, from which it derives its own existence, and by virtue of which alone it continues to exist and act as a government and sovereignty. It has no power of any kind beyond, and it cannot, when it enters a territory of the United States, put off its character and assume discretionary or despotic powers which the Constitution has denied to it. It cannot create for itself a new charter separated from the citizens of the United States and the duties it owes them under the provisions of the Constitution. The territory being a part of the United States, the government and the citizen both enter it under the authority of the Constitution, with their respective rights defined and marked out, and the federal government can exercise no power over his person or property beyond that, beyond what that instrument confers, nor lawfully deny any right which it has reserved. The rights of private property have been guarded with equal care. Thus the rights of property are united with the rights of person and placed on the same ground by the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, which provides that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And an act of Congress which deprives a citizen of the United States of his liberty or property merely because he came himself or brought his property into a particular territory of the United States and who had committed no offense against the laws could hardly be dignified with the name of the due process of law. <clears throat> And this prohibition is not confined to the states, but the words are general and extend to the whole territory over which the Constitution gives its power to legislate, including those portions of it remaining under the territorial government, as well as that covered by the states. It is a total absence of power everywhere within the dominion of the United States and places the citizens of a territory, so far as these rights are concerned, on the same footing with citizens of the states, and guards them as firmly and plainly against any inroads which the general government might attempt under the plea of implied or incidental powers. And if Congress itself cannot do this, if it is beyond the powers conferred on the federal government, it will be admitted, we presume, that it could not authorize a territorial government to exercise them. It could confer no power on any local government established by its authority to violate the provisions of the Constitution. It seems, however, to be supposed that there is a different difference between property in a slave and other property, and that different rules may be applied to it in expounding the Constitution of the United States. But if the Constitution recognizes the right of property of the master in a slave, it makes no distinction between that description of property and other property owned by a citizen, no tri tribunal, acting under the authority of the United States, whether it be legislative, ex executive, or judicial, has a right to draw such a distinction or deny it to it the benefit of the provisions and guarantees which have been provided for the protection of private property against the encroachments of the government. Now the right of property in a slave is distinctly and expressly affirmed in the Constitution, the right to traffic it in, like any ordinary article of merchandise and property, was guaranteed to the citizens of the United States in every state that might desire it for 20 years. And the government in express terms is pledged to protect it in all future time if the slave escapes from his owner. This is done in plain words, too plain to be misunderstood and no word can be found in the Constitution which gives Congress a greater power over slave property, or which entitles property of that kind to less protection than property of any other description. The only power confirmed, conferred is a power coupled with the duty of guarding and protecting the owner in his rights. 
Upon these considerations, it is the opinion of the court that the act of Congress which prohibited a citizen from holding and owning property of this kind in the territory of the United States north of the line therein mentioned is not warranted by the Constitution and is therefore void and that neither Dred Scott himself nor any of his family were made free by being carried into this territory, even if they had been carried there by the owner with the intention of becoming a permanent residence. Upon the whole, therefore, it is a judgment of this court that it appears by the record before us that the plaintiff in error is not a citizen of Missouri in the sense in which that word is used in the Constitution, and that the Circuit Court of the United States, for that reason, had no jurisdiction in the case and could give no judgment in it. Its judgment for the defendant must consequently be reserved and a mandate issued directing the suit to be dismissed for want of jurisdiction.